Social media is fast. Social change is slow. The Internet, being the only global digital network, contributes to global development and reduced poverty. But freedom from poverty also includes freedom from fear and the freedom to express ourselves, to meet and form organizations, and to share information with others. Therefore, equal and universal access to the Internet should be the overarching aim. But in the long run, what is needed to make social change sustainable? An ICT most effective as a catalyst for change. Is this working? Hi there. Um, my name is Yochai Benavi. I'm the policy director at Access. We're an international NGO that promotes open and secure access to the internet. It's a means the uh, free, full, and safe participation society and the realization of human rights. Um, we have a great panel today um, that I, I'm really excited. Uh, a couple of housekeeping notes before we begin. Um, so uh, everyone's bios are available at stockholmintranetforum.se. This is session three. Um, tweets, and we'll be, we'll be definitely trying to reach out through, uh, through social media uh, on, on the questions for this one. Um, I've been asked to do both SIF12 as the hashtag and at FX Internet. Um, to help uh, reduce some of the spam and, and make sure that we get a clean feed. Um, so uh, I think we'll introduce people as we go through the panel and through the session. Um, so I think for me, the, the conversation of ICT for D and sort of using technology to promote social change necessarily obviously has to begin with the question of access. Um, you know, how can we expand access? Uh, indeed, how, you know, through what means are people accessing? Um, as Alice sort of notes in, in her uh, sort of thoughts that she sent through, 99% you know, of Kenya's internet users connect via mobile phones, um, which is astounding to me. Um, but certainly just sort of ensuring and enabling access is not the, the end of this question. I think to sort of advance this discussion further, we need to go further a few steps down that, that uh, trajectory. So it's, then it's about a matter of quality of access. Um, and then from there, uh, once we've ensured a high quality a connection, it's a matter of education around uh, the use of technology and then focusing that use for uh, social change, for sustainable development, for poverty reduction. Uh, and then layered on top of this, um, as Guy noted uh, in his thoughts, you know, there's this notion of are we using ICT for um, reducing inequalities or for increasing productive capacity? Uh, which I think is a, is a nuanced difference that's, that's worth keeping in mind uh, as we think through you know, effective ICT for D interventions. Uh, but we'll come back to that in a moment. Um, let's start with Alice, um, who wears many hats, and I'm not sure which one you're uh, here to today, but um, <laughs> maybe you can volunteer the, that, okay. but go ahead. Um, and I wonder, uh, what policies do you think have led to Kenya's continuing success in rolling out internet access to its people? Um, and what do you think the challenges are today, uh, you know, in expanding uh, ICT for, for social change? And, and um, so where's, what's the discussion moving? Where's the discussion moving now? Okay. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Alice Munua. Um, I come from Kenya um, and uh, I chair the Kenya Internet Governance Steering Committee that's responsible for Kenya's input into uh, the global internet policy processes. Now, I mean, Kenya is a country that's well known for innovating um, and creating new business models uh, to develop what has become a vibrant uh, internet ecosystem, ICT ecosystem or ICT sector, uh, that helps us overcome a number of our own local challenges. Uh, so I'll begin by very quickly just sharing with you some statistics that are quite telling in terms of just how far the ICT sector or, you know, ICTs and the internet and mobile phones are used for development. Uh, and these are the latest statistics just received this morning from the Communications Commission of Kenya uh, that puts uh, internet subscribers uh, at nearly 22% arise from uh, 17 million. So we've got 14 million uh, Kenyans accessing the internet. Most, 90, as, as, you, as you mentioned, 99% of those accessing through their mobile phones. The number of mobile subscribers has also increased you know, exponentially. Uh, we are at 71.3%. 
uh, in terms of uh, penetration, uh, which is, you know, a record. Where's that stack up with other countries in the region? Uh, it's, I think it's the highest. It's I, the highest. I don't have the comparison, but the it is highest. the highest in, in East Africa. Mm -hmm. It's the highest in East Africa. Um, and then, strangely enough, today we found out that mobile voice has declined by nearly 5.5%, uh, including you know, other uses of data, for example, SMSs. And in fact, my, uh, my our minister and the permanent secretary was asking the economists and social um, uh, you know, uh, experts to actually uh, try and explain this phenomena because it's, 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 it's quite new and I think it's what other European countries are reporting currently. Uh, broadband subscriptions are still not that high, despite the fact that we now have, I think East Africa was the only region that had not had any um, international fiber c connectivity until Kenya, um, and the government uh, in particular actually invested uh, in uh, ensuring that we had fiber optic. The first one was the Teams, and the Teams um, uh, was a private public sector, in fact a multi-stakeholder um, uh, process that involved the private sector, civil society and the government in putting in money to ensure that we had the fast fiber optic cable then easy. Now we've got four of them uh, within the last three or so years, which, which, which is great, uh, but still very low in terms of usage of broadband. And so this is an area uh, that uh, has a lot of potential. Uh, and uh, could really benefit from initiatives in, for, you know, in terms of formulating policies and projects around that area to encourage uptake and, and capacity. Uh, and then there's the other area, uh, for the longest time we were paying such high internet uh, uh, prices in terms of access, but we now have, the, and, and there's an ISOC report, um, a very recent one that's looking at uh, internet exchange points that puts the Kenya IXP uh, as saving our local ISPs nearly 1.5 million per year in, in uh, international connectivity charges, which, which is great because in a way it's contributing uh, to universal affordable so, access. So unpack that a little bit. How did that happen, that, that 1.5 million savings? Uh, it's in terms of just, uh, instead of routing traffic from, uh, you know, uh, one ISP to another, we used to, directly, we used to route traffic through Europe or the US and then it comes back, mm -hmm. you know, so it makes it cheaper and saves quite a lot in terms of just, you know, the, an, an internet exchange point that, that, uh, uh, that routes uh, ISP traffic. And in fact, the government is also part of uh, a member or, or, and a user of the Kenya IXP, which is a, an industry-led initiative, but the government, the Kenya Revenue Authority uses it and in a way, ensures that uh, um, Kenyan citizens have access to, you know, uh, taxation processes. Um, in terms of social networks, uh, another recent um, research places Kenya as the second most active on Twitter in Africa after South Africa. Uh, the report also notes that most of the K Kenyans on Twitter use mobile phones to tweet. Um, and most of them are from, you know, civil society. We don't really have public sector and, and industry leaders are not yet actively, actively involved in using uh, social networks to the, to, the, to the extent that the rest of us are, are used to. Are used to. Uh, so you can see quite clearly that in Kenya, the internet and in fact the ICT have become a very important tool uh, for information. Uh, we are very, I think Kenya is very famous for mobile banking, our famous M-Pesa, which uh, um, you know, banks, the unbanked population with huge amounts of money, billions and billions of shillings uh, being used. So in fact, going in direct competition with banking. And in fact, that was a major regulatory headache when I was a commissioner with the Communications Secu uh, Commission of Kenya in terms of just um, how uh, the two uh, regulatory regimes, the financial one and the communications one meet. Uh, but, you know, that, that has been sorted out and uh, it's actually one of our biggest uh, innovations in terms of just uh, uh, helping us uh, overcome with our uh, overcome our local uh, challenges. Uh, in addition, from what industry is is doing, the Kenya government continues to um, try and improve service delivery uh, by having developed what we are calling digital villages in r different rural areas to ensure that we, we are able to provide e-government services to our citizens at that level. Uh, so, in a way, contributing to uh, to internet uh, usage and also uh, production of local content. Uh, we are also the first African country to have an open, open data, open government access. So that's, that's also one of the other contributions in terms of the government just simply uh, availing public data uh, and availing it in, in a way that allows for either innovation uh, or for, you know, for information for use uh, for, for other purposes. 
Um, and then we are currently also looking at our procurement act so that we can enable e-procurement in so in a way that will allow for you know increased transparency and accountability in just what you know public procurement because it's one area uh, that encourages quite a lot of corruption. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's it's one of the areas that the government is very keen to currently, uh, you know, focus on in terms of just ensuring that that happens in in a few in a few years time. And then a few a, a number of uh, incubation labs uh, coming up across you know ac across the country. The mobile lab that encourages young people to come up with you know again innovative mobile applications, you know from um, you know edu edu education educational material uh, putting up. Um, uh, there's there's an Android ap application that allows primary school students to actually. Uh, access the national curriculum and teachers to use it uh, to create an interactive you know educational experience we're just ha researching it to see to what extent it has an impact uh, you know on the various um, aspects um, and then you know social networks again not uh, not to forget in Kenya one of the others very famous one is our Ushahidi uh, you know, which was a humanitarian initiative that was developed around 2008 uh, in response to a post-election uh, conflict. So it was a way of uh, en enabling human aid, uh, humanitarian aid, to 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 reach uh, to areas that uh, were experiencing conflict and could not be accessed uh, by humanitarian aid organisations or the government, for that matter. Uh, but having said that, especially the experience of Ushaidi, I think I must mention uh, that while we com you know, continue lauding um, social networks for their de democratizing potential you know, and promotion of freedoms and democracy uh, and human rights, it's also very important to note that they have been used in some of our countries to exclude, to promote polarization, <coughs> uh, to mobilize and organize ethnic uh, conflicts, which you know, in some cases, Rwanda, Kenya, has led to mass violence. Uh, and to also again re-emphasize the point that access is still quite a major challenge. Uh, there are quite a number of marginalized groups that do not have access to the internet or to ICTs. And while, for example, uh, we, we, we put our Twitter ac uh, access as nearly you know, 2 million or so, um, when you look at, uh, in fact, we'd asked our Safaricom, because Safaricom has, I think, the largest uh, percent of uh, mobile internet users, I think 70, nearly 60% now. Uh, to actually just uh, examine how many of, of uh, uh, Safaricom mobile subscribers or mobile subscribers really are, you know, may use social networks and what are their you know, demographics in terms of just understanding who they are and how they are using it. Uh, because we, we, are still, we still feel that there are quite a number of marginalized groups that really don't have that level of access or don't use them in a way that uh, encourages uh, or empowers them uh, from a, from a you know, political, cultural contribution point of view. Uh, so potentially what, what we think the real force for social change in Kenya is not really the technology itself, but I think it's the way many of our citizens and Kenyans, I many of Kenyans have used it and adopted it uh, uh, to take care of our various challenges. And so the potential for me lies in supporting you know, civil society, supporting uh, uh, the public sector, uh, which is likely to change, uh, to change of the, over the years, uh, rather than focusing so much on the technology itself. And then in terms of, uh, as well as examining just the impact, I think we'd like to really examine the impact of social media from a perspe perspective of transforming uh, communities and the individuals involved. I think that's where uh, I think the potential also lies in terms of just developing a new social, political and cultural expectations and competencies, including perhaps increasing um, the awareness of individual rights and freedoms. Uh, so that then people can then demand them, uh, uh, and I think that's where we'll, we'll uh, be able to, to 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 see greater insights in terms of emerg emerging uh, new kinds of city. I mean, citizenship, uh, mm -hmm. emerging and networks. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Yeah, um, I think that you know obviously Kenya is doing a lot to to bridge that digital divide, and and I think that's really. Uh, and bringing people in sort of in innovative uses. I wonder now if we can maybe turn to, to Guy uh, Berger, who is the Director of Freedom Expression and Media Development at UNESCO. Um, in your thoughts, you, uh, you talked about sort of the new digital divide. Um, you said, and I'll, I'll quote for those of you uh, who haven't had the pleasure to, to read it, but uh, you know, while equal and, un and universal access should be the world's overarching aim, this notion can profitably be unpacked. 
access via a costly GPRS and a cell phone screen to content is not the same as cheap broadband access on an iPad to subscriber content. Uh, this new digital divide as regards internal forms of access is becoming a more socially significant manifestation of inequality between the old and persisting divide between the connected and the completely unconnected. Um, let's, let's unpack that a little bit further. Can you tell us about this new digital divide and, and what are sort of the factors for uh, quality, uh, high quality internet connection and, and the uh, implications that has? Okay, well, let me first uh, just say that uh I'm from UNESCO, which is uh, you know, 195 member states, and the main mandate is in the UN system to, to, is to promote freedom of expression. And it's really other organizations like the ITU who are doing access and connectivity. But uh, we do have some concerns with the issues around uh, connectivity and access, and exactly what, uh, you, what you quoted me on. Uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful to hear about mobile access in places like Kenya, in my own home country in South Africa, in much of the developing world, mobile access is, is terrific. But let's not get so carried away just to think mobile access is the same as having access to high value paid for content on a, on a big screen and, and which uh, is, is on, delivered on a broadband connection. And I think that this, this is something that we've got to keep in mind because Ipso facto, the better your connection experience, the more potential impact it can have in terms of empowering you to deal with things like social change and, and productivity and overcoming underdevelopment and oppression. Um, you know, the title of this session is, is Social Media is Fast and Social Change is Slow. And I think we can say that, well, you know, political change can be relatively fast and development is relatively slow. And so this new digital divide it can impact on both, it can impact on your political change, but nevertheless you can convene a flash mob using your mobile phones and so on. But the development challenge of actually getting uh, the access to information in a convivial format and in a language, by the way, which is a critical aspect in this whole equation, which is accessible to and contributing your own development experiences and doing business, as it were, <laughs> <laughs> on, on the internet. This is not easy to do simply on a phone. Yes, you can do mobile banking, but can you actually do a decent e-education if all you've got is m-education? I don't think so. Um, so I, I think that this thing we've got to look, look at quite carefully. And I would just add, taking up your point to go a bit further than the access question, it's also a question of use. Because whatever access you have, there's still a question of use, and I think that's been the missing um, element in the discussion so far today, which is fine because that was not the focus. But really, uh, uh, for anybody getting involved in the internet, how do you use it? Um, how do you use it as a consumer and how do you use it as a producer? And I think that's really critical in terms of seeing the way ICTs can actually promote development. Uh, the one thing we've done at UNESCO is to develop guidelines on media and information literacy. And these are guidelines for teachers training colleges to develop courses to teach school kids about how to use connectivity. Because you know, any idiot, if they have access, can use Facebook up to a certain point. But do you have any, any idea about the ethics of posting on Facebook? Do you have any idea about how you can use Facebook to empower yourself, to contribute to public discourse, to uh, cover your tracks if you, if you have privacy issues in your country, etc. These are really, really key issues. And these are issues, by the way, not just for the poor, but media information literacy is also critical, I would argue, for those who have the broadband access. To what extent can that broadband access be used? And the, the last point I'd just like to make in this regard is that when we speak about poverty, um, who, who do we mean by poor people? Okay. And I'll, uh, the analogy I want to use is that because, you know, as I said, UNESCO is concerned with freedom of expression. When a country restricts the internet, it's not just depriving its own citizens, it's depriving the entire global internet community. Okay? In the same way, people who do not have access to the internet, which enables them to contribute their stories, their content, their economic opportunities, their experiences, it's us, the connected, who are limited. We are the ones who are poor because we don't have access then to information about how the majority of people are eking out a living. 
And that poverty goes both ways. So we, as, as, as the people here speaking English and repeating and everything else, I think we need to realize we ourselves are poor precisely because poor people who are poor in the material sense don't have the kind of access which enable us and, in fact, the totality to be enriched. Thank you. I mean, I think, uh, Dorothy, you and I were talking about this as well, you know, this sort of notion of, um, you know, education around use as well. You know, there's certainly there are people who are, who are, can't connect because of just simply don't have access, but there's also that knowledge gap before we can even get to sort of the innovative, innovative uses of technology uh, for, for social change, for, um, you know, for, for inclusion um, and, and poverty reduction even. Um, so I, I think that your, your one page is sort of read as a, you know, one page overview of how to design a good ICT intervention. Um, so maybe you can talk about some of those structural forces to try and get at some of these issues that we've been picking up on, um, as well as sort of talking about that, your experiences in, in uh, Uganda. I should mention that um, Dorothy is the uh, director of the Women's, uh, Women of Uganda Network and uh, a doctor at Makara University. Um, please. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, it's uh, just to pick up on what you said, I mean, a, a very interesting thought on who's poor. Uh, because um, I think that if you want to look at the questions of access and who is doing what with technology or social media for that matter, you need to look at it through a pro, what I call a pro-poor gender sensitive lens. Because we have different access, we have different opportunities. So if you look at it through a lens of pro-poor, gender sensitive, then you're likely to hit the target that you're trying to. Why? Because as you said, there, there are many people that have access, but that's not everybody uh, in terms of where I come from. And uh, as Guy says, yes, there are people that have access, but what type of access do they have? Mobile access versus broadband access. So if you look at it through that lens, it enables you to see who is where and what are they using uh, the, the, the technology for. If you think uh, social media, for example, in Uganda, I think the numbers are that we have about 300 thousand people on Facebook, 35% of them being uh, women, but most of them in the, uh, you know, really young age group. So the, the, the question of use uh, uh, comes in. But I think uh, more to all that, really what it brings out for me is, is, is two key issues. One, yes, whatever technology that might be out there, how do people actually use this technology? Okay, um, because we've had uh, projects where we're working with women farmers and we say, okay, we provide one mobile phone to a women's group, and so there are 30 of them sharing this one phone. So they do have some limited type of access, but they have access, all right? But uh, power, true, is a problem. Uh, so they will often have to come over to the, the information center to charge their phones. But what we realize is that when they were coming in, um, there were a number of unread messages on the mobile phones. So they had received some basic training on this is how you use your phone and everything, but obviously that wasn't enough to let them know that you know when you see the little icon there, it means you have a message, please check. And if they weren't coming in to charge their phones, we would never have caught that and realized that, okay, you know, we may take it for granted, here's the phone, click here and do that, but you actually need to, in many cases, do a little bit more hand-holding to get people to use the technology in the way they need to uh, use it. The issue also is for applications, and we have a lot of debate about this. Um, you know, everyone knows you buy a TV, switch it on, and boom, you know, information comes at you. And uh, I think right now our operators have, have figured that out quite well, that you don't need to train people how to use technology if you can find a very interesting application to drive them towards that technology. So there's a big thing, I don't know if it's happening in Kenya as well, but there's a lot of what we're calling now gambling on the phone. So, you know, you get all these messages, uh, SMS and win 10 million uh, Uganda shillings, which is a lot of money in our, uh, in our country. And and people call, uh, 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 SMSing in, people are SMSing in. So it means that they see the opportunity to use SMS to call in, in the chance that they will win the 10 million uh, shillings. So I think what we need to be doing is taking part of, part of that, learn, what we learn from that, and take it into the development world. How, how, what, what do we need, what kind of, how do we need to package the programs so that people will actually want to, you know, to, to use their phones to report on something or do that? Uh, we have a project that is actually supported by, uh, by, by Spider, where we're using mobile phones primarily, to report on 
what is happening within your, your community. And uh, it's true, not everyone has access to the phones, and many times we're, we're reporting secondhand in the sense that um, we get the information and it's a project officer or an information broker who will actually post it up onto an OSHAID-based uh, uh, based platform. But I think if we have more of this going on, it's going to aid one of the big, big problems we have back at home in terms of corruption. Because if you don't have a flow of information in or out of a community, well, I can do what I want, because how are you going to know what's actually happening on the ground? We don't have enough staff to be monitoring all the roads and all the water holes that are supposed to be built and, and, and all that. But if we can get the community involved in some way or other using this technology, then you, know, you have a better chance of actually getting the aid to work in the way that you think it will work. But that again will take one that people know how to use the phones or have access to someone who will be able to use it. I think it was in the first panel where we heard of the story of the, the, the man in the village that was the one that read the mail. Yeah, so that is a way you can get something, something going. And uh, I think especially with um, with Facebook, we, 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 within, uh, within WOGNET. I should say we have a new coordinator now, so I'm no longer the coordinator, but I'm still very much WOGNET. Um, we're trying to see how do we interest the youth, all right, who are on Facebook, who are on anyway, uh, to also report about things that are happening within their communities. Because we know they're going to get on there to find out the latest with uh, Manchester United and Man City, <laughs> and I hear a lot of this, I have young people in my mm. home, so I know some of the names even if I don't know what's happening with them. <laughs> yeah, so, but, and so that's what excites me, that I know they're on there already, um, they're using some money somehow to keep updated. How do I get them motivated to do what they're doing in their other spheres for social change, all right? Either directly or helping the people within their communities to do that, providing that training. And secondly, getting these innovative um, applications. Like I said, the operators are getting people to SMS in and win some big, big lottery. So how do we do that again for mm -hmm. projects, you know, addressing social change? And I'm sure members in the audience may also know very good examples of what people are doing in different countries for, for social change. Um, I mean, should we, do you want to go in? Um, so, I mean, I think our, our next speaker, uh, Noah, is, is uh, an Egyptian entrepreneur and the founder of Weeby. Yeah. Um, and I think, obviously, we're probably all familiar at this point with how, um, you know, f uh, social media has been used to promote political change. Um, let's talk about that longer tale of, of what, uh, what Guy was mentioning. You know, social, political change can be quite short through social media, but development is a, a longer task. Um, I think that we and, and the projects that you've been involved with have been an exciting example of, of what can this look like, this kind of mobilizing the community, you know, focusing uh, the use of technology for innovative uses um, for these larger social change goals. Um, all right. Uh, my name is Nostra Steyl, I'm coming from Cairo, Egypt. Uh, first of all, the idea of Weeby, it's called World E-Business Initiative. Uh, we started this idea because we have many people who are going online in Egypt and in the MENA region, but actually they don't use it for development or anything. They just go Facebooking or chatting, posting pictures and so on, just for fun. So many people can use this for development. Of If all these youth who are on the internet, by the way, they are about... 10 million in Egypt who are on Facebook actually, so you c they can use it for promoting their ideas and their themselves. So we wanted people to go online and to promote their ideas and to become people who are affecting the society, not just people who are studying and just go to college and just work or maybe stay at home. So they can more become more entrepreneurial. So um, this was the idea of Weeby. Uh, so what else? Go on. Yeah. yeah, go as wish. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we started another thing, another initiative. We thought of the people who are um, not be able to access to the internet. We want to teach them how to go online as you want to do the underprivileged people, but we have some challenges that are facing us. Um, first of all, the language of the internet, it's English. Many people do not even know how to write or sp uh, um, read Arabic, so this is a very big challenge, so it's a step beyond the internet. We have to teach them first how to read and write and then how to use English and then how to use the internet. So it's very hard thing. But we are using the internet in something else to gather the people who are familiar with the internet to teach these people. So we are using the ICT in other way. It's not a direct way. Um, also, we have other challenge that people are um, 
we don't have the culture of change. People do, do not go, want to go online to work or to promote themselves or something. They are just working as they are. Um, we are fine. We are just gaining, uh, earning our living and that's it. So they don't go online. So we have to, again, motivate people to go and use the ICT and the internet to promote for themselves. Uh, also, it will be important for poverty reduction in my country because if people can go online, they can promote themselves more, people can know more about them and about their initiatives, so they can get more money, they can have access to the market and so on. So, for me, I, I, I just wanted to ask you, if how did you overcome this step that people go online and to go and to do the message, this in English or in your language or what? Yeah, actually, uh, language, as you mentioned, is a, is a really, really key issue. And so one of the things we're very strong on is the whole idea of information brokers. Mm -hmm. And so you do not need to be online yourself, personally, or what I call direct access, to benefit from what is available on the internet. So you find that, um, like, in... The, in a village, there may be someone who may read and write. So if that happens, then they can do it directly there. If they can't, then they're going to interface with project officers or the youth. And this is why we're really much interested now in, in targeting the youth, because most of them will have gone through school, so they'll have some English and, and, and everything. But then also the other thing is we're trying to promote uh, the whole idea that you don't have to speak English to be on the internet. You can share information in your language of choice. And this is one of the things which I think makes mobile phones very attractive because people can't talk and then they're like, yeah, I just need to use my own language and, uh, and, and move on. So one that you can find people in the community who can read and write in their language, English will make it, share it around, but secondly that you can find people that will be able to interface or be brokers for information within their communities. So if you see actually our Oshaidi platform that we've just started, there are some few posts uh, there already, you see everything is in English, but actually that has been translated by the information brokers. Having said that, in fact, in our experience, that's the most expensive part of getting this work done because um, we've done it in agriculture, we're now doing it in transparency and accountability. Most of the people that you want to interface with may not necessarily speak the local language of the community. And so translation has to, be, has to be done. And if you imagine, I mean, I'm not an agriculture person and I'm trying to translate what has been said in the local language into English in terms of what the problem they think is. And um, now we need to actually, this is a broadband thing, we're trying to see how do you get uh, simple images but small size because of the, the bandwidth. Because the, the problem we get with the experts when we pass over the information with the information brokers is that we don't quite understand what the problem is, and maybe the translation is where some of that message uh, uh, got lost. But it, as you said, it is it is a big uh, it's a big challenge. It's an expensive uh, problem to go around, but it, it needs to be done. Yeah. yeah. Because always, uh, also we wanted to use it in our uh, SMEs, the s uh, small and medium enterprises in Egypt, because they have um, a big contribution to our economy. So we have faced many challenges, first of all, the language and the culture of change, and that many people who are experts in these fields, they are old people, they are aged people. So it's hard for them to go online and to share their expertise. So you have to go to them personally in order to get the information and the experience to pass it to the young people and make them experience from it. So, so it, it takes a lot of time and a lot of money actually. So it's kind of hard to make them go online. So we are working on the youth right now so that we can uh, help each other make like a campaign or something uh, in order to help these people to have their things online so that they can contribute more to the economy we have in Egypt. So. Um, thank you. I think we'll now turn to our, our final speaker, uh, Hannah Helkris, who's the Swedish State Secretary to the Minister for International Development Cooperation. Um, we sort of, throughout this the session so far, looked at uh, sort of that, that trajectory I laid out, you know, of, of, of <coughs> access to then, you know, a question of quality of access and then, uh, you know, importance of educating people around using ICT and then uh, focusing that into sort of innovative uses for uh, social change, poverty reduction, uh, the realization of human rights and, and sustainable development more generally. Sort of what is the role of governments um, at home and abroad in, the pro in this process generally? Uh, and what has driven Swedish policy, uh, which is also obviously a funder in this area? Um, well, yeah, I'll try to 
provide a, a brief development policy maker or donor <laughs> bureaucrat's <laughs> perspective on this uh, very reality-based accounts that I, uh, that I find very fruitful. Uh, what are governments uh, in general and uh, donors in particular role in in this whole chain that you describe of access, quality of access, education, use of these technologies and really true innovative applications that can actually provide for both reduced inequalities and increased productivity. That is of course the main uh, uh, question here. And as State Secretary for International Development Cooperation here in, a, in, a, in quite a proud donor country like Sweden, uh, we tend to describe at least ourselves as both generous and ambitious in, in international development. I wake up every day, uh, not only to, of course, the remaining global challenges of poverty, misery, uh, climate change and oppression and ask myself what are we going to do today <laughs> but of course i also wake up to to the the insight that the world has indeed changed very dramatically and quite fast uh, over the last decades people who were recently poor have actually risen from poverty and people who were recently oppressed have become uh, freer. This seems like a banal statement, but I think that's important to connect to, to the headline of this uh, session that, that yes, social media can be fast, but indeed social change can too. And I think just the way that uh, people, uh, not least in Asia, and I think we think of China in particular, hundreds of millions of people uh, have, have uh, have uh, have uh, risen out of poverty, and now we have the example of the Arab Spring, where winds of freedom have have uh, have uh, started sweeping at least over parts of a region that we have come to associate with eternal authoritarianism. That is indeed uh, quite quite uh, quite uh, quite thrilling. So, from my perspective, after half a century of of uh, efforts, statal efforts in Sweden and many other countries to combat poverty um, and with a five to six billion dollar budget a year with this, uh, to be used for the sole aim to reduce, attempt to reduce poverty and oppression around the world. Uh, what do we do? Well, first of all, we have to constantly ask ourselves the questions, how do we do this in the most effic effective and sustainable way? How do we achieve real results? And this is not just to do with the ICT challenge, but it becomes very relevant when we enter, when ICT adds to this uh, development picture. Because what is that eff e efficient and sustainable way to try to achieve social change. And I won't make a claim to be scientific here, but, um, but I think there are three requirements for any real uh, social change to be sustainable. One is that we need enough passion for that change. Secondly, we need enough people to make that change happen. Um, and that's, I think, where we start to see the great potential of social media, where we see that one voice can, can, can actually reach billions. And thir third, we need enough patience to wait a bit for that change to become truly sustainable, consolidated or permanent. And this is, if we talk of poverty reduction or if we talk about fighting uh, oppression, uh, this, this, I think, think is, is a universal uh, recipe. And this is, I think, where ICT in general and social media maybe in particular enter the, the whole development picture. And that's the way we have thought about it from the Swedish side. Uh, because social media and the potential of the information and uh, communication technologies of today, they can channel that passion and they can mobilize those people in ways that also make the, the patience needed for, for, for sustainable development uh, truly possible. And that's why we have decided that in a world where the internet is the foundation of almost everything, um, every aspect of our daily lives, it must also be found at the foundation of any serious uh, development effort. So that's the way that we have, uh, that is where we have come from in all of this policy-wise. And I know I'm very keen to hear some views from the audience, so I will be very brief just to sum up that when we now see that the international global development landscape is changing 
to quite, uh, to quite a large extent with new actors entering the stage, with private actors entering in partnerships with civil society that has been engaged for ages with traditional donors as ourselves, a bit looking for our role <laughs> in all of this. Um, uh, I think that that there are a few things to keep in mind uh, when it comes to the potential of ICT in this develop future development uh, effort. And first of all, we need to rem remember that development aid, development assistance, whatever you call it, development cooperation, will never save the world, will never eradicate poverty, will never make people free, but it can be a catalyst. And in that sense, I think that aid in it such, as we know it as such, has a, a lot in common with ICT. That can not, we can't expect ICT in itself. This is always said in all seminars, I know you're tired of this, but it's not the internet in itself that is, 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 is uh, saving the world, but it is a catalyst for this. And the way we have designed our development schemes to actually bring this on is in three ways. First of all, a broad ICT for development agenda that when we go, uh, uh, when we set out to try to contribute to reaching the Millennium Development Goals, whether that be in education or in health or primarily in those sectors, we have an E perspective, which is often an M perspective in parts of the world where we are active. Uh, and for example, when it comes to governance uh, efforts, we are, we are trying to make uh, the case of, of e-government. And here we see that aid can be uh, a catalyst for infrastructure, for innovation, for inspiration by applying ICT tools to these, to these challenges. Secondly, we have made it a bit of our, we have tried to make it our brand to, to stand up for human rights and, and, and the freedom agenda in Swedish development cooperation. And here we see that we can develop ICT skills in human rights activists, uh, uh, we can provide services to to ensure safe exchanges of information between activists and so forth. And thirdly, we have told ourselves that we need to do our homework as well. So we have taken the transparency uh, challenge very seriously. We can't ask our development partners in Africa to be transparent about their budgets if we are not. So we have put a lot of effort into actually providing that information that can, that can pave way for, for, for true accountability. And I will stop there, but if I get the chance to speak later, I have five challenges <laughs> that I would <laughs> like to share with you. So. Okay, well, we'll hold on to those yeah. five challenges <laughs> for now. But um, I think uh, let's turn to the... Uh, well, actually, let's first, I want to pick up on something Guy said. Um, you know, again, getting at this question of... of Poverty reduction versus uh, increasing productive capacity, and where do you uh, see that fit into the the Swedish agenda? And sort of what government should be doing in terms of designing interventions? Do you see a difference between the two um, in terms of your priorities, and which is better if there is a preference, and why? I'm not in. I'm maybe I'm a bit stupid, but I don't really understand the question. But I will try to see. I will try to give an answer. Uh, the whole development world is struggling with how to actually reduce poverty. If we knew exactly how we were going to do that, we would be, wow. And that's why I started off by saying we've been trying different methods, different schemes, different designs for half a century in the, in the Swedish case. What we see a turn towards now is of more uh, towards more partnerships and towards more of a, more of a logic that is the same that we apply to our own societies, I, the importance of growth and, 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 um, and of interventions in, in productive sectors in order to actually make something happen, rather than just contributing with, okay, here, here is a, a temporary solution to some, uh, some, uh, some, some symptom of poverty, which has been, I think, uh, to some extent, uh, guiding us uh, uh, for, for quite some time. Are you satisfied with that? Uh, yes, I, I follow that. I just think that uh, there's a, a distinction that I was trying to make is that the political use of ICTs can help stop corruption, can change political elites who are 
stealing all the money and so on. But redistribution is a different question because then you're just redistributing stuff. It's also how do you empower people to imp improve their productivity? So you could take a country like Egypt. Um, yes, you don't no longer have uh, Hosni Mubarak and his, his clique, but how do you actually uplift people at the bottom? It's, it's not enough to redistribute what's there. It's also how do you get growth, which is what, what you said. And that, I think, is, is one of the challenges because that's why development is slower than political change because it's not just a question of redistributing resources because redistribution can eliminate some poverty up to a point. But ultimately, you've got to talk about growth over time. And growth requires productivity and it requires skills and it requires using ICT so a society can, in fact, contribute to further ICT development because it's more means of production that can then become a cycle. So, I mean, it's great in Kenya. They, they developed the... The, 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 the M commerce, well, not quite commerce, but M banking. Okay. Um, that's fantastic. That's an innovation there. Now, if people can take the, the advantages of that innovation to develop more e businesses and M businesses, and uh, let me just add one little thing. I think that the point I was saying about the different kinds of access, if you're a small entrepreneur in Kenya, say you're an artist, okay, so now you can do some M banking with your M PESA. What you really need, though, you need somehow that society to give you broadband connectivity so you can not just do transactions, but you can actually have a website which will show what your artwork is like and give you access to your market. So you've got to move up that tier, and that's partially, partially education, it's partially policy questions, but it's trying to actually say this, this digital divide has got to be reduced because no longer the, no access versus access, it's within access that becomes critical for boosting your productivity as a, as a small entrepreneur in Kenya. I would like to add something also in a country like Egypt, okay, if we want to change or we want to go for ICT, um, first of all, the government is not, um, the people there, they don't understand this very well, the concept of ICT and how to change everything to ICT. So they are thinking with the old way. So we need more new people who are thinking like the youth and how they can make things better or to how to go e-business because all what they think of making agreements with other countries, just making new buildings and so on. But it's not about how to teach the people to go online or to make initiative to, to care about the people who are doing the business. They are just caring about the framework and, and, and the, the things that are outside, not the people themselves and how to go online and how to make e-education or something. They're just thinking, mm. not the way we are thinking. So it needs help from the government to support us. It's because most of the initiatives now in Egypt, they are personal or individual initiatives and we need more support and we need more money and so on to go on. So I believe to overcome poverty or poverty reduction, it also needs support from the government, not just the people who are thinking of how to make change, so. Um, let's turn now just to see what the very patient online audience has been saying and if we can get a roving mic uh, to the gentleman in the front here in the interim. Yeah, now you can hear me. <laughs> That's good. Um, yeah, I, I think the audience has like, maybe been a bit dormant, like <laughs> tired of the lunch, I don't know, but um, lunch is really good. <laughs> um, I got at least one question directed to the panel. Um, it's from BBG Innovate. Um, what are the panel's view on role of traditional linear, how do you pronounce linear. that? Linear. 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 Yeah, sorry. Uh, linear media, uh, for example, broadcast in digital strategy to drive civil society. Get that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes, if I can comment on this, I'm 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 very hot on this topic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> First of all, I'm I'm hot because UNESCO is very concerned about media because although social media is so important, media is still the mass media is still really really important also because mass media is the one place where things come together in a public space and media is also one place where there's some agenda setting. And media is also where you can hopefully get some ethical, validated, um, researched journalism. Okay, so it's really important. Now that doesn't mean media should exist on its own. Uh, definitely not. In fact, UNESCO has a project with CEDA to capacitate community radios in seven African countries about using ICT precisely to integrate social media and mass media. 
that's number one. When you come to broadcasting more, more broadly, there's this huge move in television in particular worldwide to go from analog television to digital television. And what tends to be happening worldwide, and particularly in the developing countries, is a silo between broadcast digitization and internet development. These are two different spheres, two different universes even. And it's a hugely missed opportunity because, to give you one little example, the fact of the matter is if you saw that actually a person with a mobile phone in South Africa, yes, they can try to get a mobile version of Wikipedia, but imagine if the digital um, broadcasting was used to deliver Wikipedia to a set-top box, which is also a hard drive and has some storage capacity, the, Wikipedia, the entire Wikipedia could be delivered every Sunday night, an updated edition to every home. Boom. Isn't that a, would be a wonderful way to begin to integrate broadcasting and... Now, you also, for the internet, you need some return path. And there, you need a set-top box that will actually be linked to cellular networks that you could really begin to say, broad, digital broadcasting is, can be part of the answer to the digital divide and to access lots of fat pipes in these, these digital broadcasting, which are not being used in, in Africa because there's not the content to put in them. Fat pipes to deliver content, return path through cell phones. You know, you've got, you've got a, a, a quantum leap from cell phone access to people having a big screen, uh, a, a, a set-top box, which is effectively a computer, um, and you can, collect a, you can connect a mouse to it, and you can plug in a modem, and off you off and away. Alice, what's your take? Um, very simple. Actually, uh, our own experiences in Kenya is it's very, very important to actually work hand in hand with uh, with traditional media. First, you know, completely agree with uh, uh, what, what Guy has said. Uh, when when you look at uh, most of the African populations, most of us still use radio, even if it's through the mobile using the mobile phone. It's radio uh, and, and television. So it's important to actually you know um, mix the the, the, the two. Um, to go beyond the virtual world uh, so that then you're appealing to the broader public, to a broader public audience, especially um, if it's an issue that, that re, you know, that we are all lobbying and advocating towards in terms of social change. So it's still very important to ensure, um, you know, that we're uh, collaborating with traditional media. And we've done that in so many cases uh, with a lot of our policy processes, policy and regulatory processes. It's not just uh, limited to, to social media. Before you go, can we get a mic to the gentleman over here? And then in the back as well, and then I see you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to, first of all, I would like to express my gratitude really for having this kind of wonderful opportunity for us to speak our mind and express our views. This is wonderful, so congratulations for everyone. Uh, having said so, I think as a scholar, I'm sometimes um, perplexed. We talk about pro-poor policy, but exactly what do you understand by pro-poor? Uh, we are using terms for which we have no clarity or unanimity. Uh, but uh, the State Secretary has made, made, made it very clear that in, if you look at the, the history of development aid in the last 50 years, it has not been effective simply because eliminating poverty is a big problem. People talk, it's multidimensional. It, it, education, health, uh, name it. it. In other words, the challenges that, 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 we, that we are facing in eliminating poverty are too many to be dealt at one go. And that's a, that's a problem. But let me go one, one point clear. There is a problem, I mean, if I come from a country where there, are not, where there are not enough computers in the universities. One cannot run without going, without walking. So what I wanted to impress upon you is that we have to first walk. Uh, we are not living in, we might be living in a global world, but nonetheless, we, are, we have different needs and means. I come from a country where universities do not have enough computers. So well, what I would very much like to appeal to you is that if you have second-hand computers, please, I'll be the first one to have them. <laughs> first one, first. Secondly. Can you come to a question, please? Well, I'm here also not to ask questions, but also to contribute. Uh, there is a problem in, in contradiction between growth, what has been said, enhancing productive capacity, on the other hand, providing equity. There, are they compatible? Uh, the, other, the other issue that I wanted to, 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 to express is that in many 
what applies to Kenya or Uganda doesn't necessarily apply to Ethiopia. We have a different circumstances. And therefore, we, cannot, we are not living in one world, one global world. We might be claiming ourselves to be in living in a global world, but the situations are different. So we have to treat every case in, in, a, in a different way. I think I would like to give an opportunity for others to let me stop, but I have a lot of points to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the gentleman over here, I think, was next. We can, while we're getting, a, you have a mic? Okay. Yeah, I do have. Um, Yigai Sadik uh, from the Department of uh, Global Political Studies at Malmo University. Well, um, in theory, thank you very much, first of all, for the thought-provoking presentations. In theory, expanding internet access and freedoms does make sense for development. However, to what extent do you think, in practice, developments in ICT lead to overall developments in developing countries? So what is the spillover of that? And to be more specific, I coined this term, digital illusion of development. Can we talk about this in third world or in Africa? In the morning, one of the early speakers mentioned that uh, there are so many mobile phones in Guatemala. Let's say one day there would be more Facebook profiles in Kenya than in Japan. But would it make overall developed that country or to what extent is that contribution? I think this is one of the issues uh, that we need to be discussing when assessing the real uh, value and weight of, of the ICT technologies. Thank you. Yeah, uh, maybe if I can make a quick response to that and uh, to you as well. I think uh, this you, you raised one of the key challenges because, for example, as WOGNET, and I've, I've said already, these projects we do are really, really expensive. Uh, we have experiences based on particular areas. We can conclude that it may work somewhere else, but we can't do that for certain. So I think one of the key things that is missing is the role of academia to, to come in and study and see what is making this work here? And what would be the lessons drawn from that that maybe could be translated somewhere else, or maybe not, you see? Um, and also, because just because you have internet, like I said, we gave mobile phones, but we found out that as much as the farming tips were going out, these people were not reading them. Why? They needed, of course, some training on how to use the, the, the mobile phones and all that. And even within that, we, we started off with 12, uh, 12 groups. Uh, it really also depended on the initiative and the drive of the groups themselves. So some of them picked up those farming tips and then, you know, learned about modern beehives, about, you know, diversification in terms of farming, so they have a few goats, a few sheep, and everything. And some of the groups, you know, they, they, they didn't really take that forward. So it's not direct that just because you have ICT, things will happen. It's, it's a big picture, but I think with the role of academia, we can come in and see what works, what doesn't work, so that you can try and... Um, tailor, uh, if you will, uh, solutions or, or, or initiatives. Uh, I do a lot of work with women, and we do know that uh, the way you will approach uh, your ICT project when targeted to women will necessarily be different from targeting to men. And I get a lot, oh, there's the telecenter there. How come? Yes, one, because women have very many jobs they have to do. Okay, men maybe do. I don't want to argue that point. Yeah, but, um, <laughs> you know, by the time I'm done fetching water, cooking, looking after the kids, when am I going to go to that telecenter? All right, and you know, what information am I going to get there? Or, you know, I'll just send the kids to go over there and everything. So there's so much in terms of the local circumstances that one needs to get into. I said, we have many people on Facebook. Yeah, but they're on Facebook and they're on Man U. So how does that directly help development? Uh, so how do we get them to say, okay, yes, do whatever you want to do with the football clubs, but I want you also to spend some time doing this or maybe reporting or passing the information back from the local health center into the bigger space and then we find how to partner with the governments so that they can pick that, if, the, if you may call, the local news feeds coming through and then you know, use them either in policy and everything. And maybe also just to bring in one quick point about the use of uh, mass media. Very, very important, all right? Uh, we have a project where we're working with women farmers and we also partner with the district agriculture office. And what happens is that because we log all the SMSs or all the queries that we get in, so when they see, okay, there's so many questions coming in on cabbage, 
then we do a radio show about that. Because we know if so many queries have come in on this cabbage problem, probably the, it's a wider problem than just a few people that have been able to have access to the mobile and, and, uh, and report that in. So there will be a radio program about this, based on these few SMSs that have been able to come in. So if I may just piece on that. Okay, I just wanted to add something else. Um, in Weibi, in Egypt, our aim is not just to tell people go online and go e-business, but tell them how to do it. So you're using Facebook already, so how to use it in a good way. So I'm, I'm telling you, you have a Facebook, but still you can use it in a good way. And the people who are going to join the network, we will give them the ethics and how to use it. So the old people will know the importance of the e-business and how to go on social media and make it yeah, and use it in a, in, a, in a good way. And also the people who are going to join, they will be having this culture or this ethic that they, ha they can use it for something beneficial. They can have also the fan pages and so on, but still they can do business and get benefit from their time and that, that the money they're wasting on the internet and so on. Well, uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Amal Basha. I'm from Yemen. I'm from Sisters Arab Forum for Human Rights. Well, I have been enjoying immensely these uh, uh, sessions since this morning. And uh, I would like also to contribute. I don't have a question like my friend from Ethiopia. Uh, well, with regard to, to the uh, information and the social change, I think there are so many gaps. We are not talking o only about one gap. South and the north, there is also a gap of the urban and rural, poor and rich, women and men. So as a woman and as a, as a gender, uh, you know, uh, or a feminist, I think that women, especially in the rural, in the south, in the poor communities, are the most disadvantages. Um, we have more babies than uh, time to, to, to look into the internet or to have uh, uh, mobile sets or laptops. We don't have electricity. We don't have uh, the basic needs that allow us to, to share and to be part of this new global world. So um, I think we should focus on how can we encourage women from the south, from the rural areas, from the poor communities to be engaged. And I think this, this, is, this is not going to be um, solved unless we are looking at the global or a holistic picture. How can we get rid of literacy also? We are talking about literate and illiterate. I'm from a country where 70% of the people are illiterate and 80% of the women are illiterate. How can I talk about um, uh, social change while we're still struggling for water, for electricity, for uh, uh, other things? But the good thing that I want also to, to, to contribute is that within the Arab Spring and the Yemeni Spring, I mean, we have been um, using uh, the social media in, in a very wide way. But at the same time, the counter-revolution also were able to use it more than we, the revolutionary, can, can use it. There has been so many war over this uh, uh, cyber world, and there has so many flood of information that, that really um, uh, uh, resulted in, 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 in a devastating um, uh, results. So uh, I'm talking about the ethics. How can we use, how can we use this social media in a way that can really promote development, equality, peace, and also gender equality? Thank you very much. So, uh, Noah, you want to take a chance at answering that? Um, just to keep things moving, can we move that mic back about eight rows, and then we'll come to you, sir. But go ahead. Okay. Um, I, I, I again mentioned earlier that we all don't have the access to the internet, and many people are illiterate in our country. But still, we use the internet in order to promote the idea and make more people know about it. So it's it we can use it in an indirect way. Not all the people, me, you, and you can have access to the internet, but still, I can use it as a means to promote the idea and to reach these people. So it doesn't have to be in a direct way for each person. It can be like use it globally. Can I quickly say, uh, I think part of that indirect <laughs> way is also using ICTs to capacitate media. And very quickly, an example is in, in my previous life before I joined UNESCO, I worked with a newspaper and a radio station in a small town. 
and they produced a mobile app, which was a real-time app. And for example, it showed how long the line would be when you went to get water at the local spring. The problem is somebody stole the webcam that was showing you how long <laughs> <laughs> the line was. However, the business model of this, of this thing was all real-time, so it was real-time how long the line is at the water, but it was also real-time for what was happening in transactions. So that basically you could say, there's a special deal on now with bananas going cheap, or a farmer has come into town and is offering firewood at a reduced rate at this particular place. So all real-time on your mobile, and it expires, the deal expires in two hours and so on. And that did two things. One, it contributed to the local economy, increasing transactions, and it strengthened the business model of the radio station and the, the newspaper, which were able then to continue surviving and spreading the information through their conventional channels. Really interesting. There's a, someone with a mic back there. Sorry, I'm blinded by the lights here. So, uh, Sunil Abraham from the Center for Internet and Society in Bangalore. Uh, this morning we heard many participants accuse the U.S. administration of uh, deploying double standards when it came to freedom of expression on the one hand and access to knowledge on the other hand. One could make a similar allegation about UNESCO. On the one hand, they have uh, initiatives that promote free software, open access, freedom of expression, but on the other hand, they also have a global observatory focusing on piracy. All right, Guy, I guess we're back to you. <laughs> I, I didn't quite follow the, the point that you said UNESCO is involved in the piracy issues uh, against piracy? Yeah, you Sorry. run a global observatory uh, monitoring piracy and you no, spend that, that, a lot that, that, of... Uh, that, that's not UNESCO. It may be another UN body, but it's not UNESCO. Okay. Uh, can we move Sunil's mic down here, and then let's go to the online. Yeah? yeah. I got two questions from um, the online audience, and I've got some comments that that they're silent because the internet is so bad. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So sorry about that, <laughs> um, but at least some questions come through. Um, here's one from Kamal Faridi, sorry about the pronunciation. Um, social media threat for, uh, no, is social media a threat for governments after the Arab crisis? Uh, and the second question is, uh, we see internet use increasing in Africa. At the same time, press freedom is declining. How would you explain that? And that question was from David Global. You want to take that? Uh, social media is a threat yeah. to governments, yes. I guess. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, in Egypt it's a very big threat to the government. That's why they were shut down during the revolution, because people were knowing um, everything about each other through the Twitter and the Facebook, because they were grouping in places. So they tried to shut them down, but people were able to go through other websites to make them work. So they were watching them before and they uh, blocked some accounts and so on. So it's a threat for the government. If, to, if I just, just if, I, if I may be permitted to interrupt again, I have the page open in front of me. It is from the UNESCO website. It is the World Anti-Piracy Observatory. So either I'm deluded or uh, <laughs> you're, you're mistaken, sir. Okay. Well, uh, I can only say it's it's new to me. I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm happy to talk to you about so, it so uh, you, afterwards. You, so you would but roundly condemn this initiative of your yeah. organization? So, Neil, why aren't you? <laughs> well, uh, uh, to my knowledge, UNESCO doesn't get involved in piracy because of WTO issues. So uh, I'm very surprised to hear why that. Do, why don't we shove this conversation yeah. after, after the panel? Uh, Dorothy, a tweet-length response. It, I think the... The, the comments that have been raised are quite, uh, quite genuine. Uh, but on the other hand, there's been this debate. Um, who are the people that actually have access to social media? They will be people in the offices and everything. Who are the people out there rioting on the streets? Mm. Uh, at least in Uganda, they, they do not have Facebook. Yeah. So there's been this debate. Should you really worry so much about shutting down Facebook and Twitter? Because we've had calls for that in my country as well, when the people who mm. are on Facebook and Twitter will not end up on the streets, you know? Or should you, is it really such a big problem to worry about? There's a, a question. Okay. Mike, someone from okay. uh, Nabila Zuhiri, I'm from Morocco. I'm representing the Moroccan Organization for Human Rights. 
thank you first for the quite interesting discussions. Um, and I would like to uh, share the experience of the Moroccan Organization for Human Rights in making change in elections uh, thanks to ICTs. So as some of you might know, that in Morocco we have witnessed how internet movement and virtual human rights advocates, youth and others have helped to organize their social and political demands to organize generally peaceful movements and protests called 20 February in Morocco. And this has relatively speed up the rate of Im implementation of reforms in Morocco. The response in our case, uh, because uh, as far as I know that Morocco was like the exception, uh, that the response was uh, the review of the constitution and the organization of the elections of the House of Representatives in uh, November 2011. As an uh, organization uh, uh, advocating for human rights, we have participated and with other, many other NGOs and institutions to stimulate debates and political participation in Morocco. And as far as we're concerned, we used, we combined many approaches in monitoring the elections. We used the uh, uh, Marsad website, which is a monitoring IT website, which is based on Oshahidi example. And uh, it is called Marsad, and where citizens report political violations about all the ballots and electoral processes. This was a real exercise of citizens to exercise their right of expression and speech, and a real exercise of education of citizens on human rights. Uh, and second thing is that we uh, combined, we used another approach, is that we analyzed the debate that uh, was going around on social IT networks, Facebook and Twitter and so on and so forth, to monitor the debates about the elections uh, in the country. The most striking feature is that the monitoring uh, website along with the social networks have played a key role in stimulating debate and they have uh, Interest, interestingly enough, uh, they have contributed in enhancing the rate of political participation in Morocco. So uh, okay. this is uh, uh, just the experience of Morocco months. that I would like, okay. I wanted to share with you as a Moroccan Organization for Human Rights. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have one uh, more question from the floor, and then I want to hear Hannah's five challenges, and then we have to finish. <laughs> Before five challenges, my name is uh, Shubran Shu Chaudhary. I'm a journalist from India. We are doing a small experiment about uh, democratization of media. I don't understand anything about poverty reduction and development, but I would like to uh, tell from our experiment that like we have democratized our politics, if we want solution in the world, we also need to democratize our mass communication. I'm a journalist, and uh, but our journalism or media or communication still remains very top-down, very aristocratic. I'm very glad, though it is an internet platform, but we are also talking about mobile phone. I would like to add one more uh, um, revolution, well, like we are talking about internet revolution when radio came to this world, that was a revolution which was hijacked. Same with uh, television. So, can we create a democratic communication platform? What I am seeing is, when we tell from the top that this is good, the acceptance of people is not much. What we need to do is to create democratic communication platform, maybe including internet, radio, and mobile phone, and let people talk to each other. And when they come to the same conclusion, how to save water, how to reduce uh, poverty, acceptance will be much, much more. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Hannah, five challenges. Yeah, I'd just like to share it because I came here also with a, with a wish for good ideas from, from the audience. So feel free to contact us at the Ministry for Foreign Affairs or CEDA if you have good ideas about what a donor like Sweden should do in this field. But five challenges that I see that are quite urgent. One is that we need to get a grip of this digital divide. I think this is also picking up some of the comments that we've heard. 
what is it? It's about, I mean, the digital divide, what is it today between and within countries, between and within generations, urban, rural, men, women, and so forth. Because not only social media, but ICT in general is so fast that we risk adapting our policies, our development strategies to outdated views of the world and, and, and uh, outdated uh, understanding of needs. And this links very well to the key questions that were brought up by some of my uh, co-panelists here about who is poor today and who needs what and this is essential for us to calibrate and differentiate our our different ICT for D interventions in different parts of the world secondly something that I also think is is made a clear point of in in many of these uh, contexts is that we need to recognize the power of the simple solutions, the power of, uh, of the mobile, for example. With five billion mobiles and a number projected to grow exponentially over the coming years, I think that we see in all kinds of spheres, in traditional uh, challenges like humanitarian crises, for example, an enormous potential of online payment system, mobile banking and so forth, to actually provide new solutions to very old problems. Thirdly, we need to continue, and this is very much our homework as donors as well, to continue our struggle for transparency, because without available information about what is going on and who is doing what and what is intended, we will never achieve effective development. And secondly, we will not get an idea of what those so-called poor people actually uh, desire for themselves. Fourthly, and I'm going to finish off here because I've just got five challenges. I think we need to be aware as well of our risk as Western donors, governments, to lag behind as our traditional bureaucracies, I work in a traditional bureaucracy, so I know, and administrations, we are not capable of adapting as fast to those new technological realities, maybe, as some of those, those uh, countries that we have become used to calling developing, developing countries. And this is something that I think is an important lesson, but most important of all, the fifth challenge, is that we inevitably need to face the fact that development in the true sense of the word Word, won't happen without taking the potential of ICT seriously. And why? Because ICT is the essence of global connectivity. And all versions of global connectivity, be that trade, be that economic integration or diplomatic relations, have a proven case. Uh, it is a proven case for, for actually real progress, real human progress. And that is why we can't give it up. Thanks. All right. We are just about out of time, so it's a shame you don't have computers, because then you could tweet your closing statements. But let's let's aim for a 140-character <laughs> closing statement. Uh, Guy, we'll start with you and just work our way around. So I, I think democracy doesn't always give development, uh, but ICT can help both and empower the users. Uh, well, for me, um, uh, social networks and ICTs have enormous potential to support development, uh, but there's a need uh, to take into, consideri the, uh, into consideration the various synergies, uh, social, political, economic, cultural, and also um, people uh, and organizations. Um, there are certainly challenges to do with literacy, access to energy, the number of mobile phones, the connectivity we have, but there are also very innovative and strategic ways that we can make ICT available in all corners of the world. All right, for me, um, we all have to work on uh, promoting uh, uh, our ideas and help people to express themselves, even if our governments don't agree on that or they are fighting that. We have to do it on our own because no one will do it for us. All right, thank you to our panelists, the conference organizers, to our online curators, and uh, I see Johan waiting to get up back up on stage, so uh, I think we'll end it there, but thank you all. All right.